You know, I'm not saying that crypto is going to be a, a five or $10 trillion business, but it's legitimate enough at, you know, six, seven, at, at 700 billion, whatever it is now, 800 billion. It's legitimate enough at these levels that you have to respect the, um, you have to respect the depth of liquidity and you have to respect the fact that it's real. This is the How to Trade Stocks Options Podcast, brought to you by 10MinuteStockTrader.com, where we cover finance, stocks, options, entrepreneurship, education, and money. And here's your host, voted one of the top 100 people in finance, Christopher Ewell. Hey there, traders. Welcome back to today's How to Trade Stocks Options Podcast. Today, we have a special lesson for you. I'm putting it here on the podcast because I really believe that this is going to provide you massive, massive value. And that's what I'm trying to do here. And hey, listen, if this podcast was useful to you at all, I really highly suggest that you go check out the full trading course at AIStockTradingSystem.com. That's AIStockTradingSystem.com. Hey, make sure you subscribe and hit the bell so you'll be notified every time we give you more tools, tips, and tricks to help you trade faster and trade smarter every single week. Hey there, traders. Welcome back to today's How to Trade Stocks and Options podcast. Today, I have a very special guest online, Tom Sosnoff, host of Tasty Trade Live. And Tom, I am, I'm so grateful to, uh, to have you back on the show today. This is the third time I've had you on. That's great. Um, I, I remember, I think I remember the, I remember the, Second one for sure. I'm trying to remember the first one, but it's uh, uh, that's great. Um, no, I, I, anytime <laughs> you want. I love this. Well, this is. I mean, it's so such a, a privilege to be able to do this. And before we get really into anything, I want to direct everyone who doesn't already have a Tastyworks account to go to trytastyworks.com, and there I'm going to give you an offer that you probably can't refuse. I'm going to give you about fifteen hundred dollars of bonuses just for setting up a free Tastyworks account. So basically go there, put in your name and email, set up a free Tastyworks account, and I'm gonna give you $1,500 worth of bonuses for free for doing it. So Tom, let's get into it today. Um, I wanna get your opinion. young, I gotta ask you, have yeah. you seen The Godfather? Oh, of course. Okay. What do you mean young? I turned 35 in 10 days. <laughs> 35 is kinda young, you're, you're borderline a lot of 35 year olds have not seen The Godfather. So well, I had to throw it in there. They're mistaken. I, I should say that. No, I, when I was a kid, my mom, she would threaten me with everything. She'd say, you can't date until you're 35. You can't do this until you're 35. And just last week, I was like, you realize that like all, all the restrictions come off next week. Like I'm good now. And she's like, yeah, yeah I guess you're right. Yeah, I, I, can, <laughs> I always told my kids, you can't do anything until you see The Godfather. Oh, well, how about that? <laughs> one and two, mind you, one and two. Yeah. So, so let me get your opinion on something, Tom. Sure. There's, I feel like something great happened because people who weren't in our industry, in our sector, in our wheelhouse, all of a sudden got really excited about GameStop and Wall Street bets. And just looking at the Wall Street bets community, obviously, I, as soon as I heard about it, I went and joined. And from the time I joined, which I guess was on the early end, to now from about 1 point something million to now it's nearly 9 million people who have clicked into this community. I'm super excited about this because that's 9 million more people who didn't really care about trading that might now all of a sudden care. And that, that opens up a new floodgate for, for uh, new people signing up for Tastyworks and more people learning about our industry. What's your opinion on, on this whole thing? So I take a very similar stance as you. I felt, um, although it wasn't the perfect situation for sure, I felt that, um, now remember, I've been promoting this, this transition, this movement from, pass, from passive to active for 20 years. I feel like we've been on the forefront of this, you know, all the way back to the days we built Thinkorswim and all the way through the days of building Tasty. But um, I felt like two weeks ago, we kind of hit this transformational moment and where you can now define almost as a binary event, you know, this, um, uh, you can, you can relate it to a specific event, which is actually GameStop in this case of, you know, that, that movement officially, you know, this has officially begun. An entire generation just became engaged. The positive side of what we saw, and I, and I really do agree with you that this is a positive event and um, like I said, it's transformational in the sense that we've essentially um, engaged a generation in finance. So now we don't have to wait till everybody's 50 years old to figure right. it out. So it's yeah. great. 
So what do you think about like the the situation? So so I'll give you my my perspective. I I heard about GameStop. I looked at it and the price was like 350. I'm like not interested. And then when I was in the Wall Street um, bets community just poking around, uh, they were talking about AMC. I went and I looked at AMC. I was like, it's four bucks. For me, it's above all my my moving averages that I would care about. I'll throw some money at it. And like the next day I went from four to 24. And I was like, hey, they're on to something here. This is great. Um, but what do you think about the whole next couple of days that happened after that? It, I mean, with Robinhood being the main target here, shutting down buy orders. And then I know other brokers had similar issues. And then I know Tasty at that time had uh, Apex shutting down buy orders on on those kind of stocks. Yeah, what do you only, think about this whole for, thing? So, so only for two hours. And it was, was only, it only two because, hours. Okay. Yeah, it was only two hours. And it was only because they had a regulatory inquiry about um, you know net capital requirements. And so we quickly resolved that with the regulators and then you know reopened. Um, for us, it didn't really matter because I mean, for us, we are a firm that doesn't do a lot of stock business. So it was kind of irrelevant to us. Mm-hmm. Now that said, um, I think part of the problem, you know, that Robinhood experienced was 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 first of all, the GameStop situation was a perfect storm. And rarely you know, you can go through all, all of your entire life and not run into a perfect storm. But in the GameStop situation, it was a perfect storm. And I think Robinhood had, was almost had a breakdown that was a lot based on their own successes. So they, they, they had built up for this moment and then they couldn't support the moment. And it was a combination of not being able to handle the self-clearing aspects of the and the net regulatory requirements. It was a combination of not being able to handle the flow, which is just you know the sheer amount of you know of of calls, of accounts, of volume, all that kind of stuff. And it was also not knowing because they're not traders um, who run the company, not really knowing what to do in a panic, you know, in a, in a situation that gets a little out of control. So I I think they. They failed at handling the moment, but I think they've been instrumental in bringing us to that moment. Um, Now, all that said, I ultimately put the blame for all this, not on Robinhood, but on the regulators who have been lazy and lax to get us to the point where there is a, you know, you don't need to have two and three day settlements for stock trading. I mean, it should be instantaneous. Um, And and I think that a combination of, of regulatory um, complacency combined with, um, I'm going to blame the exchanges because I think the exchanges, the stock exchanges mostly, have an obligation to, um, to look out for what's best for retail investors. And the writing was on the wall a long time ago for this, you know, what's happening now, the explosion in growth for retail investors. And the exchanges had not prepared the regulators for this moment. It's not the regulator's job first and foremost, it's the exchange's job to, you know, to inform the regulators of what's going on. Like all of this has fallen to us. And I don't think it's fair that like Tasty has to be the ones that, you know, the ones that constantly fighting with the regulators over, you know, changing the rules to benefit retail investors. I think that's a, that's a little bit too much pressure just putting on a, a small firm in Chicago. So I think that, um, this is a combination of a failure on the part of Robinhood not being ready for the moment, the exchanges not having the guts um, or the foresight to address this, and then the regulators for just being too slow and too conflicted, you know, by forcing all the legacy firms to step up their back offices so they can support same day or next day clearing. Mm-hmm. So where do you think this leads for Robinhood going forward? Because now it seems like there's a revolt against Robinhood. They were the ones who ushered in the the, the race yeah. to zero. And well, now- I think Robinhood will be fine. I do think they have a huge. Um, I mean, there's a re- Chris. There's a reputational issue they've got here. Yeah, for sure. Which which I I mean I don't know how you 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 can't like you know time heals everything. So they'll be fine over time. But I don't know on a short term basis how they can pop back up, you know, and, and reputationally save their butts in a very short period of time. Mm, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, I, uh, 
I can only imagine that the outflow, because I was it, uh, it was last year at the beginning of the pandemic when um, Robinhood went from, I believe it was around 10 million accounts to by the middle of the year, they had about 14 million accounts. And I mean, that that's astronomical number of accounts. And then that, that 40% growth over such a short amount of time is, is huge as well. Yeah, Where do you think yeah. they, do you, do you think that they are actually going to have an issue or, or like we've resolved it at this point? I think the market's normalized in a really short period of time. And I think that, you know, I mean, do I think that Robinhood is out of the woods with respect to their technical and legal and compliance issues? The answer is probably not. Do I think that they have the level of sophistication necessary to run an efficient clearing operation for 15 or 20 million people? And the answer is probably not. Are they going to be able to expand globally? And are they going to be able to expand in other products very efficiently, given all the problems they have right now in their back office? And the answer is probably not. Are they going to recover from this? And the answer is probably yes. Um, I do think that the integrity of their entire ecosystem has taken a hit. And I do think that the, um, um, I also think that reputation, like I said, you know, they're damaged. Now, does that mean that they went from a $20 billion valuation to five? Is this a WeWork situation? Or is this just, you know what, we took a hit, we'll just sit on the sidelines for a little bit and next year we'll come back and we'll be 25 billion? And the answer is probably. You know, so I'm leaning towards the latter, which is essentially that they're they're probably gonna come out of this fairly unscathed, even though reputationally it may set them back about a year or so. Yeah, I mean, I- the amount of uproar and and burnt reputation and and burnt trust that people have i mean it wasn't just robin hood but they really they were where the majority of these wall street bets traders were trading at because it just happened yeah, to be I, like the, actually the cool i place. think a lot of i think a lot of firms failed everybody i think that all the self clearing firms you know, we we clear through a third party apex, so we were fine, and we don't do that much stock business. But I think IB raising their margins from you know 100 to 300. I think TD shutting down all option spreads, Schwab shutting down their stuff. Um, I'm not sure about Fidelity or Etrade. I really don't talk to those firms or have any customers that you know that write write to me and tell me about those firms. Um, but but I think that in you know obviously what Robinhood did, you know we were the only firm that really just stayed open and did everything, whatever you want to do without raising virtually anything. And I think that you know I've said this many times, we have an obligation as a as a broker that really wants to service everybody, and we don't have a specific demographic. We have an obligation, Chris, to facilitate opportunity. That's what we do. We facilitate opportunity. Chris, you want to do something? We'll let you do it. Yeah. That's our job. That, that's how I view, that's our technology, that's our job. And to the best of our ability, we're going to let you do that no matter what, because that's what we're trained to do. That's where our know-how comes into play. So all brokers have the obligation to facilitate opportunity. And 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 I feel like, you know, to a certain extent, um, some of the firms let, let their customers down. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, talking about that, that reminds me of when I first started trading uh, moving from leveraged ETFs into options, uh, that was kind of my path. Um, I, I tried to get options approval. I don't I think it was at E Trade or yeah, was I mean, Schwab. sure, and, yeah, and they probably it? No. said they probably said you weren't suitable. No, no, no. And, no. and then I had to get like level one, and then level two, and then level ridiculous. three. And it's ridiculous. yeah, it was such a pain. And all I yeah. want to do is just sell put spreads. It's, it's like beyond, come on, Chris. It is beyond ridiculous. That's why Tasty. We have one thing. Click the works, you get everything. Yeah. That's the way it should be. I agree. I agree. Um, I've been arguing that for years. In fact, I'll tell you something. Quick little side story. I went to one of the exchanges, undenamed option exchange. I said, listen, I'll put up the money. It was a couple million dollars. I said, I'll put up the money to build a to build an app that will you guys can use it for any firm. And then we'll we'll license it to all the firms. We'll be partners, but I'll put up all the money to do it. And this little app, what it does is it will um, it will basically standardize option approval for everybody at any level by just using an app. So you have to go through all this bullshit levels. And you know what they told me? They go, uh, we just don't we don't want to do it because. And I was willing to pay for the whole thing. We don't want to do it because it will it may 
disturb the regulators. I go, it may. this is approving people for option trading. Right. I, that, that makes all kinds of sense, Tom. We might irritate somebody. Let's not do it. Exactly. <laughs> so, you know, speaking of uh, irritating people, right? You've got uh, probably, probably the smartest man in the world and certainly the richest man in the world, um, Elon Musk, who he loves to troll people on social media. I, I find that to be fantastically hilarious. But he just bought a boatload of Bitcoins um, through Tesla. And now they're going to start uh, accepting Bitcoin as payment. Now, I know that you've traded Bitcoin um, sure. and I know that that's a new feature on Tastyworks, which actually I kind of want to ask you about more of that in a minute. What's your opinion on this, this situation moving from, I, I don't know, like the regular currency space into we're going to start accepting Bitcoins? Um, so first of all, I, I think it's inevitable that that's going to happen at some level. I don't think Bitcoin is going to become... Um, consumer transactionable in a very big sense. I mean, I think it's, first of all, I, I have two things to this. Yes, I'm very bullish on the future of, of digital assets, and I'm very bullish on the future of alternative assets. So I think both of those have a place, both from a diversification standpoint, from a strategic standpoint, in the future of everybody's portfolio and financial know-how. So the answer is bullish, bullish. However, Elon Musk has taken this opportunity to basically say F you to the banking and, and essentially current financial service establishment um, and just basically say, I can move markets better than you guys can. Yeah. And I really think this is much more of a PR scam and a PR scheme than oh, it is yeah. anything else. I mean, the transactional nature of Bitcoin is not really um, is not really consumer friendly right now and nobody's going to order a car with bitcoin trading at 40,000 and buy a car with bitcoin trading at 30,000 right. you know if it goes to 50,000 maybe but the whole concept of it just doesn't make any sense whatsoever to me it's it's it is too it is way too gimmicky do you think that if uh if more volatility comes back into bitcoin where it's going you know 30,000 40,000 50,000 back to 30 etc um do you think that they'll be like well we're not going to do the uh, the crypto for a little bit, or, or how do you think they're going to do that? I think that now Bitcoin volatility is a hundred percent. Yeah, so always. <laughs> that, that's, it's basically about four times the S and P. But if you use Bitcoin transactionally, the way I believe Bitcoin is going to be used as a, as a surrogate for you know for international banking, for money transfer and stuff like that, it's going to be almost instantaneous. So it actually has less currency risk than a normal currency transaction and far less cost. So I actually think Bitcoin has a place in the financial system and has a very um, strong place to cut out the middleman. So I'm bullish on Bitcoin as a financial asset and as a financial transferring, you know, transfer of assets. So, um, so I think it's going to play a very big role in the future. It's going to eliminate, you know, legacy clearing. It's going to eliminate a lot of crappy banking functionality and expensive banking functionality. Um, and it's going to really help the brokerage firms in the U.S. for sure with foreign accounts and things like that. So the answer for me is I'm very positive about it, um, generally speaking. And although I don't think you'd be using it to buy cars. Yeah, because I mean, you'd have to have like a, a digital window sticker if they even do window stickers on Teslas. That's like, OK, you know, at, at 12 o'clock, it's four bitcoins at, at three o'clock, it's three point two bitcoins or uh five o'clock, it's 2.8 Bitcoins, you know, it would have to, it couldn't be a static Bitcoin price. It would have to be a static like US dollar price and you can pay it, you know, the difference in the, the exchange with Bitcoins. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and I, I just look at it as like, you know, like, let's say, let's say you're a customer living in, um, let's say you're, you're, you're living in Singapore and you're working in Singapore and you want to open an account at Tasty in the US, no problem except now you've got to convert Singapore dollars to US dollars in order to trade US products. This is the way we operate in US dollars. Mm -hmm. So now, you know, we're going to send you through a clearing firm slash bank and everybody's going to nick you along the way. They're going to nick you for, you know, half a percentage point in Singapore. They're going to nick you for half a percentage point in the US. That's just transferring this way. That's, let's say that's 1%, 100 basis points. And then they're going to nick you for 100 basis points going back. So you move in $100,000, it's going to cost you $2,000 in and out. 
Mm-hmm. Right. Plus you have currency risk. That's like an iron condor before uh, Tastyworks showed up. <laughs> exactly. Now, what if you, what if you buy a hundred thousand dollars worth of Bitcoin on a platform with a $10 commission cap, like we have. Okay. And then you transfer it over and then you, and then boom, you fund your account. You sell it out the other side, hundred thousand dollars. You're done. Mm-hmm. The whole transaction costs you $20. Mm-hmm. So instead of 2000, it costs you 20 and the whole process which would have taken you two days through the banking process with all the overnight and the hour changes. The whole thing takes you instantaneous because it's 24 seven and it's around the clock instantaneously. Your account's funded for 20 bucks. So I, I mean, it's, I'm excited about it. I, I like the, the idea and the future of crypto. Um, my concern would be like U S regulations coming in and then just like shutting down the party. What do you think about that? I don't think it happens. No. No. You don't think Janet's going to show up and be like, hey, guys, you can't play with this anymore. You got to use our cryptos. No. No? I don't oh. think it's, I think it's an immovable force. Oh, wow. Okay, no. that's think, cool. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if the U.S. Is, um, is, is, wants to ultimately be one of the world leaders. And you, you cannot stop something um, that makes total sense. You know, I'm not saying that crypto is going to be a, a five or ten trillion dollar business, but it's legitimate enough at you know six, seven, at, at seven hundred billion, whatever it is now, eight hundred billion. It's legitimate enough at these levels that you have to respect the um, you have to respect the depth of liquidity, and you have to respect the fact that it's real. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. And and on Tastyworks now, which. Shameless plug here real quick. Make sure you go to trytastyworks.com. That's going to get you the links that you need to get started and get all those bonuses we talked about. Tastyworks just turned on crypto, right? Yes. We're the first major online broker in the US to, um, I'm not, I'm taking out the apps like Robinhood, but just between TD, Schwab, Fidelity, E-Trade, Interactive Brokers, we are the only ones offering um, the ability to trade crypto right direct on your platform. You don't have to do anything except just log in. So and it's just it. like trading any other stock or option like that? Except it's 24 seven on our platform. Hmm. We launched with four coins and you can trade any dollar amount you want. Bitcoin, Ethereum, Litecoin and Bitcoin Cash. We will be adding a lot more. Um, we would love to add things like being able to short, but right now it's there's a regulatory limitation to being able to do that. Hopefully we'll add other things like, you know, borrowing, maybe leverage down the line, um, uh, loans, you know, uh, Bitcoin loans and things like that. But right now we're simply, you can come in, you can buy any crypto you want and Tasty is the only platform. You can do it any dollar amount down to a dollar. Wow. That's really cool. I, uh, I'm excited to, to to try that myself, honestly. I've been looking forward to to the day when you could do that. Plus, now I don't have to go to some sketchy coin something or other and yeah, plus we're, we're basically backing it up. I mean, so you don't have to you don't have to worry about you know your digital wallet, you know, getting lost, your yes. you're forgetting the password, whatever it is. It's all on tasty. Man, that's really, really cool, Tom. What what got y'all into that idea of of we want to be in this space before other people are? Well, I mean, we are the ultimate disruptor innovator in this business. I mean, why would we want anybody else to beat us to the punch for anything? Right. You know, I mean, we we're we're the firm that mo- we're the firm that moves every market, you know, that changes every every kind of norm. So, yeah. And that's been your deal since the beginning, right? Yeah, since right. back in right. the day. Right. I mean, I was pissed it took us this long. I mean, I was yelling at my yelling at our developers, yelling at my team for the last 3 months. I mean, I wanted to launch this 3 months ago. Gotcha. So I have to ask, um, does it have a PDT rule on crypto? No, no, no. Okay, no. okay. Just I, I figured I would ask since no, it's a sure catch market. There's this. no there's no pattern day trading. You can trade ten thousand times a day if you want. So I talked to the bat not too long ago. Um, and he was saying that you guys are I mean, you go to the bat for the retail trader, which I am so grateful for people like you to do that. He was telling me that you guys are actually trying to like get the PDT removed, right? We are. We've been working on it. Well, mostly Scott Sheridan. He's been working on it for a couple of years now. And I thought we were really close to getting the pattern day trading um, uh, limitations removed. And then the pandemic hit last year and the regulators just dropped our whole, you know, they dropped the ball totally. Gotcha. Yeah. Because I mean, 
I remember the first time I ever got hit with it. I, uh, it was it's the worst. It, it was like, I was, uh, I was trading like leverage ETFs going back to that. And I was like, Oh, this is so awesome. I made my quick 30 bucks. I'm going to move over from here to there. And, uh, then I couldn't trade anymore on my screen. I'm like, that's weird. And I get an email. It's like, uh, you have a free ride violation and you have been locked out of your account for 90 days. And I'm like, is the SEC going to like show up at my door? I have no idea what just happened. All I want to do is just play the game. Kind of like, you know, Robin Hood took away. It's a dumbass <laughs> rule. It's the worst. Whoever thought of that regulatory wise, it was, it's, a, it's, a, it's a regulatory embarrassment. And the fact that they haven't changed it to now just makes me sick. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, we want all of these new people who just got their, their stimulus checks, right? To go and, and to, to be part of the, the trading industry but we're gonna severely hamper them and not allow them to make financial choices on their own. Everything's it's ridiculous, yes, agreed. So Tom, I gotta ask you, I, I heard a rumor. It's just like, I don't know if it's true or not, but um, you just became a billionaire, is that right? No, so, that something not, along those lines? No, that is not right. No? <laughs> no not at all, but... Um, we, 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 we made a deal and um, um, we are going to be um, merging with IG, which, um, which is a large um, uh, broker in the UK. And we are going to be um, taking Tasty Global. So that's one of my goals was to take, the, take our product and take, take our Tasty software and take our Tasty network and take it all around the globe. And so it's very exciting they're licensed in 17 countries. We're only licensed in the US and Australia. And so this is going to give us a chance to go all around the globe and to introduce products to their, you know, hundreds of thousands of customers that trade, you know, CFD products and turbo warrants and things like that, which are mostly like over the counter products. And now they're going to have a chance to offer their customers listed products. And our customers are going to have an opportunity to, you know, I mean, um, we're going to have an opportunity to reach customers that we've never been able to reach before with our message, with our strategies, with our content. And so Tasty is going to get explode. It's going to get huge. And I'm really excited about that. Yeah. So how did, how did that come about? Like you mentioned earlier that, that your goal was to make it global. Like did, did you guys reach out to IG? Did IG contact you? How did oh, the no, whole no, process no, happen? No. Um, well, you know, in this, there were Tasty was a pretty popular company among people looking to, expand everybody likes our business model and so we had five different companies actually bidding for us <laughs> and we chose the one that we thought was the best fit for us personally not yeah. the best deal because we were offered a lot more money but we took the deal that we thought was best for us personally so what what made it the best for you just um i did not want to go public in the u.s just because i've run a public company before and i didn't it, it was, it's a, it's a lot of strain on your time. And I want, I like doing other things. Like I like talking to you yeah. rather than doing an earnings, you know, call. And so I felt that where I was in my life, um, that I wanted an opportunity to continue to promote, you know, the content that we, that we research, the technology that we build. And I wanted to do that for the rest of my life rather than, you know, run a public company. So we chose this deal. And I wanted to go global. Yeah. So when is it officially transferred? Um, when we get say. regulatory approval, probably um, May or June. Okay. So what's going to change? Nothing. We're going to run Tasty in the U.S. and um, Tasty Trade and Tasty Works. Um, the only thing that's going to change is we're going to take them global. And and IG is not even has a very small presence in the U.S. right now. And uh, but they don't offer listed products, so. Their presence in the U.S., you know, will will help them grow their U.S. businesses, but um, uh, more it'll be just like the combined, you know, the 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 combined company will have more resources, more markets to reach, more people, that kind of thing. So, is it going to be um, Tastyworks as a subsidiary of IG, or is it going to be just the whole IG rebrand? No, it'll be Tastyworks will be like a wholly owned subsidiary. Okay, very cool. Tom, this is uh this is really interesting. I I gotta say I really appreciate your time because uh, I was um you know talking to my son ahead of time. I'm like, listen, I'm gonna be calling a billionaire, okay? Don't bother me while Dad's on the phone, okay? Don't don't <laughs> spread don't spread those rumors. I don't like that. That's not good for me. So Tom, I uh 
I got to tell you, um, what Tasty Trade has done uh, for me, and I'm sure countless number of people, has been just nothing short of amazing. You brought into my life the ability to trade options. Like I said earlier, um, I was in stocks and leveraged ETFs. And, and, and just the fact that you guys have put out enough research to show me that leveraged ETFs were a pretty terrible idea was enough to get me started saying, oh, maybe options are a good idea, right? And the whole higher probability aspect of it, it's not the buy the out of the money calls and hope for the best. It's, you know, in theory, right? You can sell something, take in the credit and then keep a portion of that credit and move on to the next trade. And I love that. And it has totally transformed everything, literally, literally everything in my entire life. So I got to say thank you for that. And thank you on the behalf of everyone listening right now. Well, we're not worthy, but we'll take it. And thanks, Chris. It was another great talk and I appreciate you inviting me on. And like I said, I'll do it anytime. Well, Tom, thank you so much. And um, remember, before you go, head to trytasteworks.com to get your account set up there today. Um, Tom, thank you again. And uh, thank you guys for tuning in to today's How to Trade Stocks Options podcast. Make sure you like, subscribe, and enable notifications. That way you never miss any of the tools, tips, and tricks that we upload every single week to help you trade faster and trade smarter. And I'll see you in the next episode. Okay, so what'd you think? That was pretty incredible, right? Now, if you like that, that's only a taste, only a sample of what you're gonna find in the full AI stock trading system. And I really highly encourage you to go and check this out. Obviously, you are interested in learning and how to trade, and that's why you're listening to this podcast. Now, I'm going to take and download my entire trading system that I use day in and day out onto you. <laughs> and the only way I'm going to be able to do that is over at the AI stock trading system.com. You're going to get phase one, two, and three, several bonuses. And on top of that, I'm going to walk you through over a dozen trades that I put on inside of my account, holding your hand and showing you exactly how I got in, how I got out, how I use the artificial intelligence data and how this could work inside of your own trading portfolio on a daily basis. So make sure you head on over to AIStockTradingSystem.com. That's AIStockTradingSystem.com to learn more and to get started and to download my decade plus worth of trading experience into your hands so you can start using the AI Stock Trading System today, the five-step system to take the guesswork out of trading. Hey, if you like this video, let me know by leaving me a like below and then subscribe and share it with somebody you think could use it as well. Be sure to comment below with your biggest takeaway from this episode and any suggestions you have for future episodes. And finally, make sure you watch these other videos to help you trade faster and trade smarter. And I'll see you on the next episode.